from the choir director at Jadutham, a Psalm of David. I said, I will guard my ways so that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle as long as the wicked are in my presence. I was speechless and quiet. I kept silent even from speaking good and my pain intensified. My heart grew hot within me as I mused, a fire burn, I spoke with my tongue, Lord, make me aware of my end and the number of my days so that I will know how short-lived I am. In fact, you have made my days just inches long, and my lifespan is as nothing to you. Yes, every human being stands as only a vapor. Yes, a person goes about like a mere shadow. Indeed, they rush around in vain, gathering possessions without knowing who will get them. Now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. Rescue me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the taunt of fools. I am speechless. I do not open my mouth because of what you have done. Remove your torment from me because of the force of your hand, I am finished. You discipline a person with punishment for iniquity, consuming like a moth what is precious to him. Yes, every human being is only a vapor. Hear my prayer, Lord, and, do, and listen to my cry for help. Do not be silent at my tears. For I am here with you as an alien, a temporary resident like all my ancestors. Turn your angry gaze from me so that I may be cheered up before I die and am gone. Remain standing as the praise team comes to lead us. Oh, my God. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, dear Lord. We thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your house to worship and sing to you, dear Lord. We pray that you'll be with our pastor and his wife as they're away from us. Bring them back safely. Be with Caleb as he brings the message this morning, dear Lord. We ask that you just prepare our hearts to hear your word. Ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. It seems that it's getting to be a pattern in my life um, that if it's Mother's Day or Father's Day, I am asked to preach somewhere, which is a little bit ironic since I am not a parent, and uh, sometimes it makes it almost feel unqualified to deliver a message on those days because I'm not a parent, but I think of the story A local pastor told me once, he said that when he first got into ministry, he was not married, and he wondered if he was qualified to do a wedding. He was asked to officiate a wedding, and he called his uncle, who was also a pastor and his mentor, and said, I'm asked to do a wedding. I'm not married. Is that right? And his uncle replied, well, I did a funeral last week, and I'm not dead, so you'll be fine. (laughs) So... With that in mind, I guess, uh, even though I'm not a parent, I will be fine in delivering this message. You know, as being Mother's Day, I, my heart immediately went towards a message to mothers, but fathers, dads, grandfathers out there, do not for, think that you're exempt from this message, because the message that we are looking at, yes, is a godly mother, but I think the example that we see today will be one that applies to parents, grandparents, and even single people. So no one is exempt from this message. You know, one of the very interesting things uh, I learned in my counseling classes, as I had two different classes that had to deal with counseling with children, is there is an insane amount of books, podcasts, YouTube videos, seminars on how to be a parent. There is probably more books written on that subject, I think, than almost any other out there. If you do a Google search of just parenting books, you'll see lists of the top 50 books from this year or that year, the top eight books if you're parenting a toddler, top 10 books if you're doing this, you know, all top parenting books if you are this, you know, there's always a list, it seems like. And while there is probably some helpful tips that can be learned from these books and some good advice that maybe you could receive from one of these podcasts or videos, I think truly if we want to be good, godly parents, we go to the book itself on the subject. You know, as many of these books, they'll teach you many strategies and activities But a lot of them were written by people who actually are not even parents themselves. They're just self-proclaimed experts in these areas. So why not go to the book itself to look to an example of being a godly parent? And that is exactly what we'll be looking at today, a godly mother. This is one of the, probably one of my more favorite stories uh, in the Old Testament is Samuel. And 
the life that he led. In, sp in spite of the world around him living very pagan lives, he was faithful. But it began because Samuel had a godly mother. And the example that we're going to see in Hannah's life today, like I said, applies not just to mothers, but to fathers, grandparents, even singles can take an example from her life and use it ourselves. So let's begin. We're going to read 1 Samuel chapter 1. Please stand if you're able for the reading of God's word. There was a man from Ramathium Zophim in the hill country of Ephraim. His name was Elkaniah, son of Jerome, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zub, an Ephraimite. He had two wives, the first named Hannah, and the second, Peniah. Peniah had children, but Hannah was childless. This man would go up from his town every year to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of Armies at Shiloh, where Eli's two sons, Hophini and Phinehas, were the Lord's priests. Whenever Elkaniah offered a sacrifice, he always gave portions of the meat to his wife, Peniah, and to each of her sons and daughters. But he gave a double portion to Hannah, for he loved her even though the Lord had kept her from conceiving. Her rival would taunt her severely just to provoke her, because the Lord had kept Hannah from conceiving. Year after year, when she went up to the Lord's house, her rival taunted her in this way. Hannah would weep and would not eat. Hannah, why are you crying, her husband Elkaniah would, say, would ask. Why won't you eat? Why are you troubled? Am I not better to you than ten sons? On one occasion, Hannah got up after they ate and drank at Shiloh. The priest Eli was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. Deeply hurt, Hannah prayed to the Lord and wept with many tears. Making a vow, she pleaded, Lord of armies, if you will take notice of your servant's affliction, remember and not forget me and give your servant a son. I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and his hair will never be cut. While she continued praying in the Lord's presence, Eli watched her mouth. Hannah was praying silently, and though her lips were moving, her voice could not be heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long are you going to be drunk? Get rid of your wine. No, my lord, Hannah replied, I am a woman with a broken heart. I haven't had any wine or beer. I've been pouring out my heart before the Lord. Don't think of me as a wicked woman. I've been praying for the depth of my anguish and resentment. Eli responded, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant the request you made of him. May your servant find favor with you. She replied. Then Hannah went on her way. She ate and no longer looked despondent. The next morning, Elkanah and Hannah got up early to worship before the Lord, and after they returned home to Ramah, then Elkanah was intimate with his wife, Hannah, and she, the Lord remembered her. After some time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel, because she said, I requested him from the Lord. When Elkanah and all his household went up to make their annual sacrifice and his vow, uh, vow offering to the Lord, Hannah did not go and explain to her husband, after the child is weaned, I'll take him to appear in the Lord's presence and to stay there permanently. Her husband Elkanah replied, do what you think is best and stay here until you weaned him. May the Lord confirm your word. So Hannah stayed there and nursed her son until she weaned him. When she had weaned him, she took him to Shiloh, with her to Shiloh, as well as a three-year-old bowl, a half bushel of flour, and a clay jar of wine. Though the boy was still young, she took him to the Lord's house of Shiloh. Then they slaughtered the bowl and brought the boy to Eli. Please, my Lord, she said, as surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this boy. Since the Lord gave me what I asked him for, I now give the boy to the Lord. For as long as he lives, he is given to the Lord. Then he worshiped the Lord there. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we come to you now opening your word to, to hear the truth of the message that you have for us. Lord, I pray that you would hide me behind the cross. Lord, and that I pray that these words would not be my words or thoughts, but Lord, they would be your words of truth. Open our hearts and minds to hear from you this morning. Lord, remove those distractions. We are a busy people weighed down with many cares and concerns. And Lord, that, not that they're not important, but Lord, I just pray right now we would not be distracted by those. 
but we have an open heart and open mind ready to receive the truth of your word. Be with us now, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So as I said, we are looking at a godly mother in the life of Hannah this morning. We don't have much information on Hannah's life prior to, actually don't have really any information on her life prior to the story, and we don't really have much afterwards other than what is mentioned in chapters 2 and 3 of 1 Samuel. So we have to take the little bit of information we have to glean the truth that God wants us from this story, but there is enough information here we can make one conclusion for certain. Hannah was a godly mother. So that asks the question, what made her a godly mother? I'm sure in all those countless books that have been written on parenting, there's probably someone how to be godly parents. And there's probably some guy out there making a lot of money telling you the steps you need to take to be godly parents, but we can learn so much from Hannah's life that we have the equipment needed. We have the information needed to be godly parents. So let's begin here by seeing what made Hannah a godly mother. It begins there in verse 4. Whenever Elkaniah offered a sacrifice, he always gave portions of meat to his wife Peniah, to each of her sons and daughter, but he gave a double portion to Hannah. For he loved her, though the Lord had kept her from conceiving. Every year, on a regular basis, Hannah and her husband would go worship the Lord. And that's the first thing we see that made Hannah a godly mother, is that she worshipped regularly. The worship of the Lord was not something that was when it was convenient for her, when she could fit it into her schedule. No, we see that Elkanah and his wives worshipped the Lord regularly. The worship of God was a regular, routine part of their life. No, as we could read and hear so many things on how to be godly parents, it is simple as this. Godly parenting starts with a godly relationship. Hannah had that relationship with the Lord. A regular part of her worship of God was in her schedule. Could you imagine if they were so faithful in their yearly sacrifices and worship, they probably were faithful in their regular worship. She didn't see church as something to fit into the schedule if possible. She didn't see worship as a burden. She saw worship as part of her life. Do we have that same kind of desire in our life to make worship a regular part of everything we do. You know, this week I was talking with a gentleman and he asked me the question, he says, he's uh, Hispanic and his English is a little broken and he, he says to me, he goes, how often do you go to church? I said, what? He goes, your church, how often do they have church? I said, well, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, so I guess two days we go to church. He looks at me, he goes, I go to church four days, all excited, smile on his face. I said, four days? He goes, yeah, I love it. He goes, I, I go because I love it. I would imagine Hannah's life was something of a response like that. I love to worship God. Faithfully, regularly, she was at worship. Before Hannah was a godly mother, she had chose to be a godly person. That's why I'm saying this message this morning does not just apply to mothers or fathers, but to everybody. Do we make that choice to regularly worship God? Do your children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews, see a regular part of worship in your life? Is the worship of God that important? Every year, they would gather to worship together as a family, to make this yearly sacrifice, to offer this vow. They gathered together. Is the regular worship 
part of your life. There's so many distractions in our world today that try to keep us from worship. But we cannot allow that to happen. We need to make the worship of God a regular thing. Because the first step of being a godly parent is we need to have a godly relationship. We need to have that relationship with God. Hannah probably was excited for this event, even her husband. This was a big deal to them to be in worship, to gather together in this moment and worship and sacrifice, give praise to God. The worship of God was a regular part of her life. But the second thing we see in Hannah's life was prayer was part of her life. Down to verse 9. On one occasion, Hannah got up after they ate and drank at Shiloh. The priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. Deeply hurt, Hannah prayed to the Lord and wept with many tears. Making a vow, she pleaded, Lord of armies, if you will take notice to your servant's affliction, remember and not forget me. Give your servant a son. I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and his hair will never be cut. While she continued praying in the Lord's presence, Eli watched her mouth. Hannah was praying silently. Though her lips were moving, her voice could not be heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long? Are you going to be drunk? Get rid of your wine. No, my Lord, Hannah replied, I am a woman with a broken heart. I haven't had wine or beer. I've been pouring out my heart before the Lord. Don't think of me as a wicked woman. I've been praying from the depth of my anguish and resentment. Hannah was a godly mother because she was a praying mother. Long before Samuel was given to her, long before she received the great gift of being a mother, being a parent, she was praying for her child. It says in her anguish she prayed. She didn't just casually throw up a prayer and say, hey God, if you happen to catch this one, it'll be good. No. In a deep sorrow of her heart, she cries out to God. I said, we don't know much about her life prior to this event and not much after, but we know she was a praying lady. Her prayers were heavy on her heart. This burden that was on her heart was so heavy, she couldn't even voice the words to God. But she came to God in prayer. There is such great power in prayer. Throughout the Bible, we are reminded of that power of prayer. So the life of Samuel, as we see here, started through a prayer. Paul tells us to pray without ceasing. Numerous times throughout the Bible, we see prayer. The only other thing we really see in Hannah's life is chapter 2. And it starts out in chapter 2, verse 1, says this, Hannah prayed. My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is lifted up by the Lord. My mouth boasts over my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you, and there is no rock like our God. That's just the beginning of her prayer in chapter 2. Hannah sought the Lord in prayer, because she knew he could answer her prayer. Hannah prayed for her child. She prayed many a prayers. It seems to be this was a yearly event of her just coming to the temple, going to that altar and just praying, Lord, hear my prayer. So you can imagine if she prayed this long and this hard for this son before he was given to her. How much more she prayed for that child once he was there. Parents, do not cease to pray for your children. 
Do not think that once they reach a certain age, they're good. Do not cease to pray for your children. Do not cease to pray for your grandchildren. The children in your extended family, do not cease to pray for them. No, as I was thinking about the power of prayer in preparing this message, I was thinking about what Jesus prayed in John 17. Towards the end of his prayer there, he says about, he prays for those who would hear the disciples' message and believe. If you are a believer this morning, if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are the product of someone's prayer. Somebody, somewhere, prayed for your salvation. I remember one of the first times I heard that message preached in John 17, the guy that was speaking said he was the product of that prayer. Because when him and his wife started dating, he was not a Christian, and his now mother-in-law prayed endlessly for him to receive salvation. And he said he didn't even know about it till years later, that she had been praying from the beginning. Parents, pray for your children to know the Lord. Pray that they would love the Lord and they would come to that saving knowledge of salvation that is found only in Him. But Hannah demonstrates here in these few verses that you don't just pray for needs, but you give praise in prayer. And as we're I read the first couple of verses of chapter 2. This time her prayer is not a burden on her heart, but it is praise to God. She demonstrates her adoration and praise for God through her prayer. My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is lifted up by the Lord. My mouth boasts over my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Parents, don't just... Pray for your children, but teach them how to pray. So many times I feel our society, when it comes to children, we have the mentality of do as I say, not do as I do. But when it comes to being a godly parent, we cannot have that mentality. We can't say, I want you to pray for the Lord or pray to the Lord if they don't see you doing the same. We can't teach our children to love the Lord if we are not demonstrating the same. I don't have a lot of experience with kids, but I have learned very quickly they pick up on everything they see. If it's a routine habit, maybe a phrase that you say or activities you do, they will pick up on it very quickly. We often laugh at those stories, and some of them are quite humorous, but we know if you're demonstrating a godly example, they're more likely to pick up on a godly example. Teach your children to pray. Don't just pray for them, pray with them. There is so much power in prayer. As I already said, I will say it again, we are here today, if we have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we are the answer to someone's prayer. You may not know it now, but someday you will. You will find out somebody was praying for you. And if nothing else, we have that example from John 17 where Jesus prayed that you would believe the disciples' message. You would believe the gospel. Prayer was a regular part of Hannah's life. Hannah prayed because she trusted God with the answer. She knew that if anything was going to give her a son, if that son would love the Lord and serve him, it was only through answer to prayer. She brought her burdens to the Lord in prayer, but she also brought her praise. Do our children see us praying in such a way? Do they hear you pray? Do they know that you pray? I'm so thankful for my parents because from an early age we would do devotions together when we were kids and dad would pray for us every night. There was an example 
set in prayer. Do your children have that example? Later on in Samuel's life, actually right near the end of his life, as he's kind of turning the power over to the people as they wanted a king, he says, I would consider a sin to cease praying for you. It was no accident that Samuel knew the power of prayer. I think it was an example of the power of prayer. Praying parents produced a son who saw the power of prayer. Pray without ceasing. You know, Paul says those words, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. Hannah is a prime example of that. She prayed without ceasing. She rejoiced in the Lord even when he didn't answer her prayer, but when he did, she gave thanks. So Hannah worshiped God. Hannah prayed to God, but Hannah trusted God. Hannah got to the point in her life where she was broken over not being a parent. A prayer unanswered began to weigh down on her life so much that she was just trusting God with the answer. Her trust was that the Lord would either answer her prayer or maybe he just had a different plan for her life. But she was trusting God. Verse 15, No, my Lord, Hannah replied, I am a woman with a broken heart. I haven't had any wine or beer. I've been pouring out my heart before the Lord. Don't think of me as a wicked woman. I have been praying from the depth of my anguish and resentment. Eli responded, go in peace. And may the God of Israel grant the request you made of him. May your servant find favor with you, she replied. Then Hannah went on her way. She ate and no longer looked despondent. She left the temple that day. She left worship on that occasion, trusting God with the future of her life. You know, Eli could not guarantee God would answer that prayer. He said, may the Lord. But with this hope that her prayer was in the Lord's hands, she left trusting in the God she prayed to. She demonstrated her faith and trust in God. She didn't know what the Lord was going to do. Maybe next year, when they came to make the yearly sacrifice, she would still be without child. But her trust was not in her anymore. It was in the Lord. She demonstrated her faith in God by trusting Him with this prayer request that she has. And it says the next morning... Elkanah and Hannah got up early to worship before the Lord, and afterward they returned home. Then Elkanah was intimate with his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. And after some time, Hannah conceived, gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel because she said, I requested him from the Lord. Hannah put her trust in God. She trusted that if the Lord, if anybody was going to answer this prayer, any way possible for her to receive a son, it was not in her. It was not in human hands, but it was in a great, powerful God. That's probably one of the hardest part about our prayers, is that we have to trust God with the answer. If you're like me, a lot of times when you pray, you pray, Lord, give an answer to this question, but you're already thinking in your mind, how can I do it myself? You already have those ideas, those schemes planned up. Well, this is how I'm going to make this work. But with Hannah, she had nothing that she could do other than trust God. But she trusted God to answer her prayer, but she also trusted God with the life of her child. 
When Elkanah and his household went up to make the annual sacrifice and his vow offering to the Lord, Hannah did not go and explain to her husband, after the child is weaned, I'll take him to appear in the Lord's presence and to stay there permanently. Her husband replied, do what you think is best and stay here until you've weaned him. May the Lord confirm your word. So Hannah stayed there and nursed him until she weaned him. When she had, she took him with her to Shiloh, as well as a three-year-old bowl, a half bushel of flour, and a jar of wine. And though the boy was still young, she took him to the Lord's house at Shiloh. Hannah does something that required great trust in God. The son that she had waited for so many years this answer to prayer. But now she is leaving him in the Lord's hands. Again, Hannah trusted God. Verse 27 says, I prayed for this boy, and since the Lord gave me what I asked him for, I, give, I now give the boy to the Lord. For as long as he lives, he is given to the Lord. Now, what makes this such a great demonstration of trust is that she's leaving him with Eli, the Lord's priest. Don't seem like a bad option. Why? I mean, he's the Lord's priest. He'd be a good example of a father, right? Well, jump over to chapter 2, verse 12. Eli's sons were wicked men. They did not respect the Lord. She demonstrated great faith and trust in the Lord by leaving her son in the hands of Eli. A man who, very quickly, we learn from verse 12, failed as a parent. She was not trusting in Eli's parenting abilities, but she was trusting in a great God to take care of her son. Eli's sons were wicked men. They'd done so much evil over time. But Hannah knew her son belonged to the Lord. Hannah knew this child was not in her hands, but he was in the Lord's hands. Hannah trusted God to take care of her son. Hannah trusted the Lord with her child's life. You know, that is probably, I would imagine, one of the greatest challenges of being a parent. Is that you must trust the Lord with that child's life. Trust that God will work in their life. God will protect them and guide them. Hannah put Samuel's life in the Lord's hands. She dedicated his life to the Lord. She could not control his future. She not guarantee that he would even live to be a godly man. But she showed an example of a godly mother. She demonstrated through her worship, through her prayer, and through her demonstration of faith and trust. And then she put him in the Lord's hands. I'm not really sure what Eli thought about this, as he is an older gentleman, and now suddenly he's taking care of a young child. He sees the rotten example that his sons were. And now he has to raise this child like his own. But Hannah trusted that he was where the Lord wanted him to be. Later on, it says 
in chapter 2, if one person sins against another, God can intercede for him. This is Eli talking about his sons. But if a person sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? They would not listen to their father since the Lord intended to kill them. That's one of the most sad verses, I think, in this story, in Samuel's life. Eli's sons had strayed so far from the Lord that the Lord intended to kill them. But then the next verse is a verse of hope. By contrast, the boy Samuel grew in stature and favor with the Lord and with people. Somewhere along the way, Eli had failed to be a godly example to his son. Because the Lord even condemns him for that later on, that you honor your sons above me. But Samuel saw a godly mother, a godly example from his parents, and he grew in the Lord. You know, there's no magic formula here this morning that if you just do exactly as Hannah did, that your child will be perfect, never make a mistake. But as I said, children learn from example. They learn from what they see and what they hear. If you want a better chance for your child to learn to love the Lord, you need to demonstrate this yourself. Let them see you worship. Let them hear you pray. Let them know that your faith and trust is in a great God. Now, our children today are offered many opportunities to put their faith and trust in many things. We're always encouraging children to get a better job, make more money, look out for number one. But let our example be not of encouraging our children that life is all about money and success, but that life is about a love for the Lord. Let us demonstrate our great faith in God by dedicating not just our children to the Lord, but our lives to the Lord. What a great example it would be if we lived our lives like Hannah did. Hannah's faith and trust wasn't in the latest and greatest parenting books, wasn't in what popular psychology might say, but her faith and trust was in the Lord. Samuel goes on to live a great life. I love the testimony near the end of Samuel's ministry where he pleads with the people. He says, if I have done you wrong, then let me know. I'll repay it. And he makes that plea, you know, if I have sinned, if I have stolen against you know, something from you, let me know about it. And they say, you have done us no wrong. There's no guarantees, like I said, that your children will live a life like that. But what better opportunity they have than to see that demonstrated in the home and in the church. So for the parents out here this morning, I ask you to really consider. Do your children see the importance of worship, prayer, and faith in your life? If not, then I want you to examine your life. Examine this morning what you are saying, what you are doing. Where are your priorities? Even if you haven't demonstrated it in the past, it is not too late to start now. Let the world see the faith and trust that you have in God. Let your children see that example. And for those of us who aren't parents, it's not too early to start living that way. 
no matter what stage of life you're in, we can demonstrate our love for the Lord through our worship, through our prayer, and through our faith. See, this message is not just for parents. It is for believers everywhere. Be a praying people. Be trusting people. And be faithful people. Be in prayer now for your future. If you don't have kids yet, be praying for those kids already. If you're not married yet, be praying for your spouse. If you are a parent, be praying for your children. Do not stop. Pray that they would love the Lord and know Him and serve Him. Pray with the faith that Hannah had, that God has His hand around those children. Dedicate them to the Lord, but also dedicate your life to the Lord. Samuel goes on to live a life of loving the Lord. Now his is a little different because God had called that. God had ordained that to happen. There's no guarantee that your children will, but again, the example of a godly parent goes a long way. The example of worship and prayer has great impact on the next generation. It always goes back to the question I like to talk about, usually when I'm doing sermons regarding parents. You know, we always ask the question, what kind of world are we leaving for our children? But let's ask the question, what kind of children are we leaving for this world? Do we teach our children to love the Lord? Do we teach our children the importance of worship? Do we demonstrate for our children great faith in a great God? And if you haven't, then let today be that day that you begin. But as I said early in this message, it begins with that relationship with God. Do you have a relationship with God? If not, as we get ready to close here this morning and Wes leads the the hymn, I ask you to come forward and we... We can start that relationship with God. Today could be the day of the greatest relationship you've ever had. You put your faith and trust in God, repent of your sin, and receive that eternal life. Because it's one of the greatest gifts that mothers and fathers can leave for their kids is the assurance the day will be in heaven if something would happen to them. Maybe this morning you're thinking, I have failed to be that parent. Come to the altar. We'll pray with you. This could be the start of a new day, start of a new step in your relationship with your children by being a godly example. Whatever you need to do, I encourage you to come. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this godly example of a mother who could do nothing but put her faith and trust in you. Lord, we pray for the children in this church. That they would see godly examples, not just through their parents, but through the other people around them. Lord, that they would see their need for that relationship with you. And for anybody here this morning, no matter how young or old, if they have not placed their faith and trust in you, then I pray that today would be that day. This would be that moment where they say, I am a sinner in need of a Savior. As Paul says in Acts, the Lord calls everyone to repent. Lord, to be a great example 
of a godly parent, we need that godly relationship. So Lord, I pray now that whatever stage of life we're in, that we would begin to work hard on that godly relationship so the world around us would see not just a person, but they would see an example of you in all things. Be with us now as we close. And it's in your name that I pray. Amen.